Um, it's a real pleasure to introduce our seminar speaker today, Dr. Michael Judge from Manhattan College. Mike was my undergraduate mentor at Manhattan College, was really the first person who inspired me to think about graduate school and think about graduate career in marine sciences. So it's really nice uh, to welcome him back to Stony Brook and to SOMAS. Mike started his love affair with snails as an undergraduate <laughs> researcher at URI. Uh, after that, he went to uh, UC Davis, completed his PhD, looking at wave exposure and how that affects rocky intertidal uh, communities. After that, he did a postdoc at Dolphin Island Sea Lab under Ken Heck and Lauren Cohen and essentially focused on mercenaria, mercenaria. After that, he came to Stony Brook and worked uh, for another postdoc with Jeff Lovington, looking at fiddler crab uh, closing forces in their claws, and uh, also conducted some experiments looking at how flow speed affects benthic invertebrates in Flax Pond. Mike started at Manhattan College uh, 20 years ago, and he is now the uh, professor there and chair. Um, his, his lab currently is looking at uh, toxicology research with metalloids, his research that he's going to show today about snails, and some invasive species modeling, uh, particularly with uh, hemigrapsis crab. So with that, uh, I would like to welcome Dr. Michael Judge, and his talk is Life at a Snail's Pace, the Effects of Thermal Load and Desiccation on the Tropical Sublittoral Nobby Periwinkle. <laughs> so, is that loud enough now? Okay. Thank you, Constantine, for that wonderful introduction. I can remember back to what I did in my life. So, um, <laughs> it's nice to be back here at, at uh, Stony Brook as well. As I left here, Ninety-three. It's a long time ago, and I've been back a couple times since then, and not in this room. So it's all new to me. Although all the walls look like the same color as back then, so it's not really changed. <laughs> um, thanks for inviting me, and a uh, chance to talk about some research I've been doing. And this is, this project really has been something that I kind of stumbled into. And I'll say that's somewhat that it's somewhat fortunate to get an opportunity to do a project over a long period of time. And it's had a lot of interesting features to it that has kept me interested over a number of years. And I've tried to piece things together. So what I'm talking to you today is a bunch of little projects that are pieced together over a series of different years. Things that started some time ago when I was oh, I was fortunate enough to start teaching a marine biology course, which had a spring break trip to the Virgin Islands. And I tell the students they had to do a project in the class. So it only behooves me to actually start a project as well. As well. So that's what started this genesis. And, and from there, it's got me thinking more about this, this strange organism. I find it strange or interesting for that way. Um, as an ecologist, I am intrigued with organisms that may be at some of their uh, outer limits of their ability to survive. Because I think that really tests uh, some interesting responses by organisms. So when they're really challenged, that might give you some opportunities to see what might limit their distribution, abundance, and so forth. And you can look at things, so looking at biology of extreme environments gives you some in insights into what organisms can do and how they're able to withstand those conditions. You can look at a variety of different levels, like physiology perhaps, to some aspects of behavior, survivorship, growth, and so forth. And when I look at those, any, any one of these may give you some insights of what, how the organism responds, but in total, you want to look at the total package of what, um, uh, what the organism might be doing. So I've been a long training in looking at intertidal work. And so I was trained along that way. Think about the intertidal uh, regimes from high tide to low tide here at Hope Bell Rocks in, uh, in Bay of Fundy. Uh, looking at tidal range and how organisms are either ultimately submerged or emerged and how that can gives a challenge to organisms, either uh, when, you're, when you're flooded, access predators, when you're out in the air, drying up, things of that sort. And that might give some challenges to organisms and look how they respond to that sort of stuff. It's like it's the classic setup of intertidal, uh, rocky intertidal work. You have zonation based upon aspects that happen at low tide, desiccation, temperatures, and so forth. High tide, maybe you have uh, predators that kind of come in there, leading to those zonation patterns. And so, of course, 
take it to snails, make it venture tidal. So I said, let's take it to the Virgin Islands, where I've been doing some and bringing classes to down there. And, and this afforded me an opportunity to look at other locations and perhaps other aspects of these physiology or growth rate of organisms and ask the question, if you're in a tropical region, um, how might those patterns or stresses play out? Um, the site over here is in St. John, um, U.S. Virgin Islands, in the southeastern corner. Um, and mostly, it's, uh, it's really a, a tropical deciduous forest um, with some shrubs and so forth. And one might expect that some of the stresses of intertidal organisms here might even be greater than elsewhere because it's quite warm for much of the year. Um, it's also very dry as well. So what I stumbled upon was this kind of, it's a nondescript snail, quite pretty looking, but very small, um, found mostly on Caribbean rock walls and rocky surfaces. It's not the shell that you usually see people collect for anyway. But it's uh, I found these rocky walls. And it intrigued me about these guys hanging on rock walls. And a few years ago, 10 years ago or so forth, I think I came upon one of my students that said, Cheryl, what are those snails doing up there? Are they alive or not? They just seem to be way up high. And so that started me going on this project here. And as I started looking around more and more, it even got to be really intriguing to me that some of these things you look at and say, okay, these are ring snails. Um, and we wouldn't think they're intertidal, but actually they spend most of life well outside the intertidal zone. And can be found not only on just twigs and so forth, high off the ground, but also grazing on cacti, or at least crawling on cacti. And that kind of intrigued me to a great extent. Now, what would be a marine snail doing on a cactus? It doesn't seem to follow the book. So, in fact, you can find some places that may be as high as 14 meters above sea level. Um, I don't know if they're pretending to be land snails, but it, it intrigued me a little bit. What could they be doing? Um, so I started wondering what, how they had managed to persist here, and this has got going on to a few projects over the years. So some initial observations, I just get you back on. Usually when you see these guys, at least in the dry season, um, they're not doing much at all. They're usually just sitting around, and they're really the only species of uh, invertebrates at this level here, marine invertebrates up here. It's well above everybody else around there. So uh, they're really like marine snails pretending to be terrestrial organisms. Um, and what was intriguing too is I started looking at these guys. If you place them in the water, they seem to be all kind of the shell and start crawling around very rapidly, right, right, but most of the time they're just doing nothing. Um, and so it's got to be interesting. So I started asking some questions along here. Asking, okay, how are these guys able to persist here? Uh, they're the only organisms up that high. They're marine snails, and they seem to be, for all I know, alive, but not doing anything. So I said, how are they able to withstand all this? And so I started doing this, this is a series of different projects over different years of asking questions of a variety of different levels. Uh, you know, what temperatures do they, um, do they, um, do they um, uh, encounter? Um, can, do they suffer stress of the water loss? What might be some response at the physiological level? Uh, a lot of individuals have looked at uh, stress proteins. Um, HSPs to look at as indication of stress. And so if I look at these guys that way too, what kind of behaviors do they have? How do they respond to different things? How do they respond to maybe wet, rare wedding events and so forth? What habitats and micro habitats might they use? And lastly, trying to integrate over a longer time period, uh, how does it affect the so survival and growth rate as well? And so I'm going to try to piece some of this together. First, what kind of temperatures do these guys actually think? Uh, encounter. And so what I've done here is I want to easy thing to do is go around with a little pocket infrared thermometer and just measure the snail surface temperatures, which is a pretty good proxy for the internal temperatures as well, and look at the rock temperatures as well. And so I can go around to different locations and sort of measure some body temperatures. Um, I can look at like, different types of surfaces, go up the open surfaces, their social little cracks, or maybe even some deeper crevices where they're more into the rock itself. Um, I can look at a variety of different activity levels and how that influences body temperature and so forth. And so, first I want to say, how hot do they get? And so on this diagram over here, I have two bits of information here. Uh, first, these are snails that were just in full sun and stationary snails. So I just went out and found some snails out in full sun and looked at some measure a bunch of body different temperatures. I got two things I'm reporting here. One is the actual body temperatures, and they vary quite a bit. Um, but you can get places where snail temperatures regularly exceed 47 degrees Celsius and sometimes even approaching 50 degrees Celsius. Um, and what I've got at the bottom over here is the temperature difference relative to the surface they're on over here. So these temperatures on the surface get you know, 54 degrees Celsius, 
the snail body temperatures can approach 50 degrees sometimes. But the first thing I look at is if you look at this body temperatures themselves, and, and they're in full sun, they get pretty much the same type of temperatures. Not big differences, um, maybe a little bit higher in the crevice, but not really strong association with that. They do seem to be slightly, uh, uh, the if they're on the surface itself, the body temperature is. Uh, if you look at the surface type itself, though, down the surface, they seem to be a little bit cooler than the surface. They're probably out a little bit higher, maybe out of the boundary layer a little bit, to keep a little bit cooler than the surface. So there are some differences in the surface temperature differential between their body temperature and the rock surface. But again, um, uh, in, in essence, a big story here, that they get pretty hot in this location, at least the spot measurements. So I said, okay, what about if they're actually crawling around? Now, sometimes you can actually find them crawling around if the conditions are appropriate or suitable for that. Maybe after a rain event, or you have high relative humidity, or you're near some, some different water seeps. So here I've got some data over here. Some snails have been crawling around asking aspects of their body temperatures as they're crawling around. And so I've got two parts over here. The surface conditions, whether the surface was wet or dry, or if the surface was in the sun or shade, and what type of rock was it darker colored rock or a lighter cup of colored rock and look at some of their body temperatures. And first off, um, as you might expect on drier surfaces, the body temperatures are hotter. And they make no difference what type of rock they're on, not, not significantly different anyway. They generally pot, you can see from this diagram, so you're getting 40 degrees, but you still get individuals that are well above 40 degrees. Uh, some of these differences are here depending upon orientation of the sun and so forth. If you look at a, uh, a shade versus sun, again, not so much surprising. You get, you get warm snails and the sun versus the shade. Uh, the difference is that way, just as you might expect in this regard. The important part here is even while they're active, they can get some pretty high temperatures out here in the color on these surfaces. If things start getting dry or growth humidity goes down, they shut down pretty quickly and just go into repose. Okay, so I know they can get hot, all right? So at least in for spot measurements anyway in time. So the next step is, okay, do they lose water? Sure, they lose some water out there. And so what I want to do is, so how much could they be stressed by losing water and over what time frame? Um, and so I try to approach it from a couple different levels. One level looking at it in the laboratory and dissipation chamber at various times. You know, the aspect of looking at the field, how much water might lose in that way. A couple of different tidal heights at different times and so forth. Uh, the lab data is pretty straightforward. If you take snails and you measure the mass before and afterwards and look how much mass you lose over a period of time. Um, you can have some measurable mass loss, particularly over seven days. You may lose a big portion of the, the water, uh, tissue water, maybe a something approaching 20% of their wet tissue weight over, over a period of some little seven days. But there's actually measurable water loss over a period of time. So that sounds good and interesting in that regard. Um, does that ha what happens out in the field? So in this case, I take the snails and put them out in the field inside this desiccation chamber. And even though the snails don't have a tendency to crawl around very much, I want to make sure they didn't move. And so the nice thing you can do with the snails, you can glue them to a rock. A little super glue keeps them convinced to stay in one place. Um, you can try it. It doesn't hurt me to kill them off afterwards, that's fine. In fact, in all the studies here, I've killed no snails. Okay. Park service wouldn't like that anyway, but they're also tough to kill. That's part of the story later on. Um, what I've done here, taking snails, and move them a couple of different tidal heights, two different sites, one that's facing north, one that's facing south, a couple of different tidal heights, and do the same sort of stuff, bring them out to the field, and we'll look over a couple of days. All right. And so, you see a lot more variation in the field than you might expect as well, but same sort of stuff, either north facing or south facing slopes. Um, no really difference. Uh, uh, there's no, the only differences you have here is that the lower Lower shoreline ones have a tendency to be a little bit less water loss, but not, not really so. Um, what you really know from here is the water loss, the take home message from this one is that the wa mass water loss is about the same as I would get from the laboratory as well. So I lose about the same amount of water in a zero uh, humidity desiccation chamber as I did in the field. So you do have measurable water loss for these guys in the field as well, at least over the course of four to seven days. Four to seven days. Now, intriguingly, though, that these are kind of spot measurements, and, and I'm going to look, try to extend the time frame on all this and see if one spot measurement or a short period of time, a few days, does it extend to longer activities. And so I want to do, ask the question now, snails, they actually exist in a wide variety of different types of microhabitats, and for multiple days at a time. So spot measurement may be fine for one period of time, but it's, it has a reflect these individuals in a longer period of time. 
They may be found on open right white rock, maybe up on bits of grass, maybe on, on, on cacti, uh, sometime on crevices or on exposed black rock. And the question is, do these, temper do these surfaces have consistent differences in temperature? And maybe that one spot measurement over that one actually measured it doesn't really pan out over a longer period of time. So we did um, the studies looking at some snail mimics where you take a snail and um, and fill the inside with modeling clay so it will have water loss in it on there and to measure some body temperatures of by using snail, snail mimics and to put this thermistor probe in there and measure temperatures of these snails at a variety of different habitats see what happens over a period of time. So these snails were put in four different common types of habitats, and they were put in four different locations nearby, and they're all logged into a, a data logger, which I can record their temperature every, I think it was every minute or so, uh, for a period of time, these four different sites, to see if there's consistent differences over a day, uh, over multiple days. So it goes into this little data logger this way, and record that, and offload that data to see aspects of what the Snail temperatures might be over a longer period of time, these are every five minutes. So, uh, what I want to show to you is some aspects of what temperatures look like. First, I want to show you just air temperature for nearby, probe nearby. You might expect this lovely tropical weather here, and then get down to 22 degrees at night, and maybe uh, upper 20s in the daytime. That's what they expect in tropics, such as nice breezes going by, and so forth. That's what you might experience out here. But these snails, what might they be experiencing? So what I'm going to show you now is a trace of temperatures each day, each of the four different snail mimics here. And I've got the white rock is in by the, the yellow over here. Black rock is, is, is in the red crevice and grass. Apparently. The air temperature is still down the bottom. One thing I want you to notice on here, the temperature swings tremendously during the daytime. So you might have temperatures that get down to you know, 25, maybe 24 at night for these snails, but they regularly get over 45 degrees Celsius, and particularly at some, some sites more than others. So in this particular location here, the black rock and the crevices had the highest temperatures. We have lots of time, well above 45 degrees Celsius. That's pretty hot, these guys. So I would think it's pretty hot anyway. Um, and so we have this time series over here, and so one way to look at it is asking how much time during a day do the snails end above a certain temperature. And so I've got here is a series of number of minutes per, per day that a snail experiences a certain temperature. And so all these sites had plenty of time above, or time above 40 or 42 degrees Celsius. When you get to these black rock or crepe sites, you may have over a half an hour to an hour every day on average where you have temperatures well above 46 degrees Celsius. So they're heating up out there. So the next step from there is, well, if they're heating up that way, you get some measures of that, are they being physiologically stressed? And for this, we thought, well, we'll hop on that bandwagon of looking at HSPs um, to see if that's a measure of stress for these snails themselves. One would think they're getting pretty hot and fresh proteins might be induced on here. So HSPs are, are just molecular chaperones, which help stabilize other types of proteins and cell growth during stresses. Um, and we're going to look both at um, HSP 70s, HSP 90s, as different types of classes of uh, these chaperone proteins to see if we can see what type of patterns we might have with these, these snails. Um, some of these may be always expressed considerably, or some may be induced uh, depending on conditions. And so I'm going to look at both of those as well. So in conjunction with that, those temperature profiles I just showed you before, we're going to look at if the pattern of expression seems to match either the habitats in some way, the microhabitat type, that is, you see more of the, of the habitats or greater induction of the habitats of higher temperatures like the black rock and less of the grasses. Also, does it, to be uh, biologically relevant, we're going to see what the time scale response would be as well. If they're fluctuating over the course of the day, are they responding on that time scale, or are they responding over a longer period of time, and so forth. This is some work that myself and two colleagues have reported on as published a couple of years ago. Um, and so, the snails are all collected from a, uh, another location, part of uh, the common area far further away brought back to a laboratory site to hold them overnight in a common environment. So we stuck them into a you know, tank of seawater overnight just to get them all acclimated to the same temperatures. And then the next morning, we put them out in the field and glue them onto a rock 
um, and put them on the head. Back to the they stay there. And so this is done with the conjunction of those temperature uh, trials that I just showed you just previously. So also to have a mimic what the temperature might be in those sites as well. So initially we took the snails, for, uh, snails of each half of habitat were removed both twice during the day, both at about one o'clock in the afternoon and also five o'clock in the afternoon, uh, as well as snails from time zero. We crushed all those um, stake and, and stored them on ice and brought them back to, to New York for, for an analysis. What's that? Uh, ah. uh, <laughs> Those do kill the snails. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, you can't do this with park animals, but the U.S. Virgin Islands Nat, uh, Territorial Park Service allows you to collect snails to use for that purpose. So, yes, it is probably, as it turns out, in retrospect, this is. Uh, Way. That's probably one of the bigger sources of mortality in, this, <laughs> in these snails, actually, and be killing them. So I don't think we're going to go back that way again. Uh, but yeah, you do have, they, don't give, they don't give up their proteins willingly. <laughs> um, this is a representative of uh, uh, Western Block for the HSP 70s. Um, and on here, this is just a control lane over here um, and, and uh, a molecular marker and various different types of treatments. So we have things collected at different times of the day, either at, at 1 o'clock or 5 o'clock, uh, if it's on a, on a white rock or a crevice and so forth on here. And so uh, we've, if we've done what other people have done is, and, and use and assume the slightly higher molecular weight band of 70 kilovolt is a constitutive and the inducible is a slightly smaller. Um, and using that as a convention on here. So we, have, we did this for a number of different snails in different locations. These kind of bands, and then we have to standardize it from on acting presence so we have uh, the things proper on expression. This is the type of data that we get from that sort of stuff. Now, I'm going to walk you through this one. So on a microhabitat type in the bottom over here, I have at the point of collection of individuals when they've been acclimated overnight in the, in the uh, seawater in the tub in the lab, and then the black rock, crevice, white rock, and so from the bottom here. Remember, the white rock had the lowest temperatures as opposed to black rock had the highest temperature on here. And on the y-axis, I have mean band intensity from different ways of looking at these, these proteins on here. So on this top one over here, these are the inducible edges these 70s. Um, the first thing I want to point out to you is you put them into the acclimation chamber, the HSP 70 levels go up. So if you use that as a measure of stress, Putting them in water is a bad thing, which is kind of remarkable to me anyway. So they're probably just not regulating at that point. But if you stick them out in the field, uh, either the black rock, uh, the crevice, white rock, and so forth, you have set, at least inducible, you seem to have some of a tendency to increase as the time goes on the day. It's not a very strong one, but what's really remarkable is that I have a particular very strong pattern with the temperatures I have with snail mimics versus where the pattern of the HSP would be. They all seem to be getting lower. Uh, then they would be just being, just just as I put them out in the field at eight, at, uh, eight o'clock in the morning over here. So uh, we can get measurable HSPs. They do go up when you put them in, in, into seawater, uh, but we don't see big differences among these sites. If anything, they're a bit lower than the the, uh, the activation control, um, and not really very many sites very much. So okay, so what do they do? Well, I ask, now I'm going to start moving this into some other, some other type of behavioral type responses to these guys. I'm trying to get a bigger picture on this one. So those are individuals stuck glued to a rock, but now we also know they can respond to different uh, uh, behavioral to some of the different microhabitats as well, different things. So these snails are typically out of the water and don't get wet very often, but maybe in a rainstorm they may get wet. If they're 14 meters above sea level, they're probably not going to see any splashes. Many of them are two or three meters above sea level and when the tidal range is only less than a foot anyway. So there's not much splash as well, maybe a hurricane in there. Well, that's relatively rare as well. So I decided, well, um, how do they respond to these rare, rare wedding events? Uh, so I decided to collect snails from a variety of different types of surfaces, so a similar type of exposure at those locations. And then try to ask them questions um, about how they might respond to either just small bits of water, or steep water coming down from the terrestrial environment and, and, uh, and influencing them, and or how they might, what happened if they get directly immersed into seawater directly, uh, perhaps maybe fell off a rock into the high pool or something of that sort. 
and I want to look at how they respond well to some seawater as well as some fresh water to uh, disentangle the effects, maybe the wave splash versus uh, uh, a rain event. And I also want to look at some aspects of the hydration history, what, where they collect them from, and whether or not they have been exposed to water, uh, probably active or, or proposed. So the first part over here, uh, I, I set up an in situ uh, drip irrigation system. Uh, so it's a series of tubes and pipes and so forth, bring, out, bring the, the apparatus out of the field where the snails are, and look at the snails on a variety of different surfaces. So I collect the rocks from some dry surfaces and, and, and expose them to different treatments of whether or not fresh water or salt, or salt water. And so I have here a bunch of snails on this piece of PVC pipe holding into place. I set up this manifold over here where the water is coming down from a head tank and it's dripping on the rock surface. And so they've been out in the sun and I've, been, and I've done this a different way, they out in full sun or a different slope of the rock. Uh, light levels and so forth, but basically the sim simple is I put dry, snails with the dry, place them on this apparatus over here, and drip water on it and see what happens. And I do it with both uh, fresh water and salt water, and I look at the response. Now, snails don't do a whole lot, so the response are relatively simple. Now, do, when do they initiate activity? So, have they initiated activity? They come out of their shell within 30 minutes. Uh, when they actually start crawling, so initiate activities and tentacles out, as your crawling is actually moving, and I also look at the direction of movement. As they move uphill or laterally or so forth. And so here's a snail that's starting to crawl away at this point up here. So if I do this sort of stuff and ask the question, first, so these snails that were that were in the dry, they were dry snails from dry surfaces initially, and I placed in this location here. And look at a water type. Um, on this axis up here is time to initiate activity. So some individuals never responded within those 30 minutes, and so I can treat them as non-responsive or I can treat them as responding for more than 30 minutes. Uh, either way, we find here a very strong difference in response. That is, if you place, if you have seawater dripping on them, they come out of the shell relatively quickly. Uh, at least generally within a couple minutes, and begin crawling around. Uh, whereas if you drop fresh water on them, a lot of them don't respond at ever 30 minutes. They just seem staying there. They don't do much at all. Uh, it's kind of strange in most of the locations where I did these studies, I'm well below the splash zones, I only expect them to see seawater there. Uh, time to begin crawling, exhibit the same pattern as this, a uh, bunch of same sort of stuff, it's no effects of slope or light level and so forth, and the direction of movement is not really profoundly different, they all move about the same direction, but uphill. Okay, so they respond quickly to seawater but not freshwater. They said, okay, well, maybe that's not as realistic, or let's try something different. Let's say, let's say we get dropped into a tide pool. So in this case, my little tide pool with little saucers over here. Uh, little saucers with different water or no water in it. And so in this case, I took snails, um, and I collected snails from a variety of different habitats, and fresh collected them, and, and I would just drop them into a bowl of either fresh water or seawater or nothing at all, and see what might happen there. I collected snails. Uh, some snails I also took and put it into seawater for a period of time to get very active, very hydrated, see what they respond in that case. And again, I did much the same thing as before. Uh, time to initiate crawling. In this case, they respond quicker, so I hit the threshold of what happens within two minutes, uh, crawling or activity level. Some snails I collect on dry rock surfaces. Here's some uh, buttonwood tree over here. Sometimes you see a lot of snails on that type of tree. See much the same sort of pattern here as well. Seawater, they respond much more readily, much rapidly. They come out of the shell, uh, usually within a minute over here, drop in the water. Uh, whereas if you give them fresh water, it's the same thing you saw before. They don't seem to respond much at all to all of this uh, fresh water. Um, and interestingly enough, fresh water is almost the same response as if you drop it into nothing. So we see here they're dropping it, just dropping the bowl. Sometimes they get out of the shell for that, but generally they don't do much response. And so dropping fresh water respond almost the same way as dropping it into nothing. Whereas seawater consistently, consistently causes them to come out and crawl around. Could you tell us what the different bars are? Oh, the bars? Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, what I've, I've expressed the data in two different fashions here. Uh, the solid bars, I, I, individuals that never responded, I just did not count, count in the analysis. If you, but truly, those individuals who didn't respond are ones who are taking longer than two minutes in this case, or only 30 minutes in the other case. If you include those, you see a bunch of the same patterns. So it's basically telling you that individuals in freshwater, a lot of individuals that never responded. And it's funny, they don't come out and crawl, they're doing nothing since so it's, it's a very long time. Whereas individuals here are that much. Tell me your analysts for most of these experiments. 
I mean, you're looking at hundreds of stamps or ten? There's 90 in the end of that. Not, yeah, that, that's yeah. probably about 100 in this one or so. Or the book yeah. and the other one's about that as well. So, oh, okay. Yes, yeah, so it's, yeah, so it's okay. yeah, oh. this one. There we go. Yeah. So, so snails also, so if they can respond to seawater, can they also respond to other types of uh, features in the environment? And I want to look, go back again to some aspects of what type of habitats I might be able to find them. In this case, it's okay, well, let's take some snails, tag some individuals, release them in the field, and come back over a period of time and find out what type of microhabitats they're found on. I mean, they have a very gross pattern here. Are they open on the surface? Are they partially associated with a little crack they can't really get into? Or are they associated with a larger crack that actually get into something deeper? And so I want to see what the frequency of these habitats would be, and also how these snails from a known history, how they're, where they may be found in that location. So on here, uh, these snails are the uh, the first set of bars over here, uh, open bars over here, are the available type of habitat present. So by taking pictures of the surface, I estimate that about 50, just under 50% of the surfaces would be considered open surfaces, maybe just about that single uh, cracks. In a very small fraction, maybe only 10% can be really considered crevices which are large enough for the snails to get into. And so I uh, follow these snails over a period of different months and came back and, as you might expect, very few snails are found on open surfaces, and over a period of time, more and more snails have a tendency to be found into cracks and not on the open surfaces. Uh, so they do seem to aggregate around crevices and not so much on the open surfaces. So, what is all this going to mean? Well, one thing that's true is that we do notice, we do take samples of these snails at different locations. They do vary in sizes to some of these different microhabitats. Is it part of behavior? Is it part of growth rate? I'm not sure entirely. But we, thought we try to look at some of the different sizes of snails at different sizes of different locations. They ask the next question, they vary in growth rates. Uh, but would have a tendency to get larger on, um, as opposed to the rock surfaces on there. And so, do all this matter in the long term for these snails? And so what I did is I did a kind of mark recapture of snails starting back in, in uh, 2003 and tried to measure snails and their growth rates over a long enough period of time. Um, and so I put out little bee tags, tag these snails, and super glue does last for eight years in the field. I tag snails, it's interesting in that itself. <laughs> uh, and you can come back and find the same snails year after year. And so I want to see if you're going to find, does it affect their growth rates on these individuals? And so uh, this is a sample of the field site, these different rocks. It's turned out, I tried a few different sites around here, they move around a bit, there was no consistent differences in growth rates in the site, so all the stuff is going to be lumped together at this point over here. First I want to show you just uh, my efficiency of recapturing the snails. Okay, so how many tag snails do I capture at each time? So, so this is the proportion recovered on a given day. As you might expect, as time goes on, it gets harder and harder to find nice snails. But you know, early on you can find 60 75 percent of snails. But even after 10 years, or nine years, I say a year ago, I could capture at least about 10 percent of my initial snails, uh, which I think is pretty remarkable. Um, some snails over here, I can't. As, as time goes on, you might expect. I know they're my snails, but they have tags, but they're not really legible anymore. They're kind of wearing off. And if I had the foresight to think I could actually find snails nine years later, I'd be doing double tagging. I didn't do that at that time. But uh, so these are these are events here where I did my marine biology class trips. The not sample means I didn't offer class that year, so, uh, <laughs> so otherwise there would be sample data at that point. But as you might expect, you have a kind of exponential decline in, in tags, uh, in tag snails, as you might expect, either tag loss or just individuals moving away. So what about the pattern of recovery of snails? Who do I find? Well, this is a graph of the number of dates I found each particular snail that ha I had an identifiable tag on them, and the proportion of snails recovered. So, as I go across the x-axis here, that means more, more that snail was captured more times. So, some snails were captured every single day. Very, very few, but a couple snails I found every single time. Most snails were captured two or three or four times, so I had repeated measures of the same individual. Uh, only about oh, 12, 13 percent of the snails were never recaptured. Um, and what is actually kind of interesting is that just because I never recaptured doesn't mean they've disappeared. Because even, uh, let's see, so that'd be eight years later, I had not seen that individual for eight years, but I found it in 2011. So it's in a rock, so that means if I keep searching, I might find those missing snails. But I have a nice recovery out there. 
then uh, 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 look at all these different snails all the way, and it's a time series of their growth rates. Again, every, all my snail, all 850 or so recaptures for the time years, I never, none of my snails had tags on them ever dead. And I saw it's very different from any dead snails, shells around these snails anyway, absent the deep stress protein. That experiment. They're very rarely to ever find empty shells. You can find a lot of shells, all the snails around the Caribbean, but these guys almost never end. They've been dead almost all over the lot. So I find these guys over and over again. Now what I have here is uh, is a Ford uh, uh, Walford plot of looking at how the growth rate of these snails change over time from the initial length. And this is some of the newer data of the last few years. Uh, so I look at the growth rate per, per snail for the time series of 2003 to 2008, so five years worth of growth, or seven years worth of growth, eight years worth of growth. And we're right, these three these three lines in here is the best fit associated with that. And I'm, from here, I can predict the growth rate and how fast they grow at a certain size. I get size-specific growth rates. So these are smaller individuals and how fast they grow, and bigger individuals. What's intriguing is they all seem to have project a cessation of growth of about 16.5 millimeters. And it aligns the, 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 the uh, intercept, zero, intercept here is, is almost identical for all of these. And even more intriguing is it matches what was published in the paper a few years before that. This is data from a few years before. They always seem the same crossing point. Uh, so no matter what point I look at, if I look at a growth over just one year, over eight years, all seem to head in the same direction of growth. Uh, 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 declining too close to zero uh, at about 16.5 millimeters. Now some individuals are bigger than that, but that's that's the general maximum size. And so you, from this, you can actually make projection of growth rates using a uh, uh, bottom line growth functions. And it might take close to 20 years for individuals to get that size. Of course, they, they plateau out that way. But it'll probably take them at least 15 years to get within 90 percent of that size. So they're probably pretty long lived as well. So. Uh, this is getting more intriguing to me. They don't die, same there forever. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess you don't want to do a dissertation on these, right? <laughs> so, I think we're this much faster than I thought it would go through here, and I give you some type of questions. So, in review, this is the sort of stuff I've been trying to piece together over the last number of years of different aspects of responses. I think in some ways it makes it even more confusing to me how these guys are making it. Uh, because their body temperatures do get quite high. Uh, you know, it's not uncommon to find these guys well above 45 degrees Celsius on a regular day, and they certainly lose a, a measurable amount of water. And individual, other indiv individuals that show these snails can maybe lose twice as much water of that and still survive. Uh, you, can, you can measure HSPs in these individuals, but it doesn't seem to be highly correlated with the microhabitats themselves, even though the temperature profiles are different. They may be just shutting you down, going to infestation or something of that sort. They do respond to the way, uh, rapid uh, wet, rare wedding events. And particularly seawater shows a much stronger response than others. Uh, they do seem to prefer some microhabitats, or at least found more commonly in some microhabitats and crevices. Uh, they do seem to find, if you really want to collect a lot of snails quickly, if you find some buttonwood occasionally, that's often a place where you find lots of them and collect them fairly easily. Uh, the mark recapture rates astonish that like, actually capture snails. Uh, I know who they are even nine years later. Uh, but it's interesting that you know, the adult individuals never really seem to grow at all. They just seem, I've got individuals I've measured seven times. And it gets kind of boring on my uh, growth uh, spreadsheet having the same size every, every time. Uh, and it's more intriguing. All these snails, the only snails you see that killed in here were the HSP1 and 4 build clay in there. So they've seemed to have a long, long time. They don't seem to die. I don't know what they're doing, but they seem to be hanging on. So um, I think for that, I think one just question, I guess. So, so, uh, so uh, I thank the helpers and so forth. The I mean, work at the Virgin Islands uh, uh, Environmental Resource Station over the last number of years and the help uh, other organizations as well. Thank you. Solitary? Do they ever clump together? Do they they the, the, the story is they go down to the shore level in the summer, late summer time, um, and, and at least the eggs get that at that point. Um, and, you know, sometimes I, I think there's one one year I did find a, a large number of very small individuals 
down to the straw line. Once they get to the bigger size, they just move up beyond everybody else. Uh, how many they, how many that do that? I don't know. Yeah, I've got some measurements of crawling speeds. They can't really get from the up level down and back in a tidal cycle. It's just too far for them to go. You, you do find uh, if the conditions are really good and after the rain, you might see a, a mucus trail that may go one meter or maybe a meter and a half or something. You know, they can go a good distance overnight if it's, if it's really great places. Yeah. I have questions. I have a question. I'll start. I'll start with some little ones. Um, and you answered one of them, which is that they these guys do have the plankton trip flow. Yes, they do. They don't have, and who knows how long they're in the water, and then they metamorphose down there, and sometimes they grow up. How small are the smallest ones that you find up shore? And could the smaller guys just be hiding out? Fair question. It's, uh, these are rocky surfaces that you do a lot of coping and cracks and crevices. The small would be tough to find. Um, I, I can see the small ones down low in one reproductive year. One year I found a lot of small individuals. But up higher, I've never, I don't think I've seen anything smaller than about four or five millimeters up high. And, once they, and when they get up higher, and that's, that's still maybe down really low, but once they get up about two meters above sea level, it's, fine, it's hard to find anybody less than about you know, 12, 13 millimeters in size. Yeah, well, they didn't have to reproduce very often. Yeah, they just don't. They don't have to have successful reproductive reduction. Yeah, but it's intriguing. Once a decade, once every two decades. They, they, even though they come out seawater, you put the seawater, they always do. As soon as they come out around, they defecate right away. They hold that for a long time. That's the other side to all this. Have you ever been there after a after a hurricane? So no, I have yeah, not. Yeah, just because because it may be that the timing of all of this sort of reproduction stuff is just linked to when they are going to be inundated. Yeah, this yeah this mostly has been done with the opportunity of what I've been able yeah. to get there. Some of it I've done in different times of spring, from January to to June as well, but not right after a hurricane. Uh, that's mostly it correlates to dry season. They they seem to be a little more active in the when you get to June, the humidity starts increasing. Uh, crawl around that. So they often spend most of the time doing nothing as well. So. so if they lose 20% of their water a week, how do they, where do they get the water from? There's no water volume. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but or did, is, could it be that at night they get the water from the air? I mean, you, you well, those, 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 their, their, their perpetual wasn't closed shut. So, um, some individual, some of that graphic, some individuals were down low. I think one got splashed or two got splashed during that time period. Um, I know from the literature they can lose at least twice the amount of water and still survive from that. Some of the people that's report. That's two weeks. Yeah. What's that? You, you said that's just two weeks. So they you know, closer, they can go a month without getting water. They can survive in the laboratory in dry conditions for a month and still seem to survive fine. Um, I had a promise to the Park Service I wasn't going to kill these snails at that time, so they wanted to. They not too long. I didn't know how long they could go at that point, but they certainly had some measurable water loss, and they can probably stand greater water loss than that too. It seems there are some changes in their physiology where they're out of water for a long period of time. I didn't go down that route. Some of that stuff can polish as well. No land predators, dogs, mice, rats, <laughs> goats, goats. I think one of the opportunistic events they get is up high when there's goat dung around. That's a, if they happen to get into a little crevice with goat dung. Um, the interesting, if you look, that, that is intriguing. You, you, you almost never find examples of crushed snails any place. I mean, that, so that, that doesn't mean a, a person can't come along or an animal come along and take it away. Um, you, but you also don't find much damage on shells, as if somebody, some organism was trying to pick at it and couldn't get to it either. Given I can keep collecting snails over nine years, it's probably not a big mortality on them by, by predators. And, and, it, and the experiments with decay is almost what you expect. Maybe you know, the loss of tag, you just can't find snails crawling around. Yeah, it, it, certainly other snails you find, other snail shells you find more damage or are expensive on predation on those. Not with down grass and but also, um, what well, the local fishermen say they don't taste good, so I've not eaten them. So. <laughs> Everyone, they're, they're terrible bait. What do they eat up on these rocks so high? I mean, the algae is not growing seven meters up above the rocks. So, what do they know? What they're grazing us? Lichen. 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 But they do it. Some of the reports are they do something. There are, when you have wet season in the rain, you might have some 
algal growth on those surfaces. They might get opportunist feeding of that sort. They, they probably get opportunist feeding every now and then. That may be the small ones can get those points to get some food. I, I think here, they may get lucky enough to get some uh, goat dung. That's probably the bigger ones. They get a little grazing on cactus. I don't know about that, how much they get to those. Um, they probably don't get a lot of food. I don't know how, I don't know why they get so active. It's bizarre to me that they, they come out activity level very quickly, even though there may not be a lot of food around. You, you can just think that's really expensive to get crawling around, wasting water, wasting energy. You're not going to get a whole lot anyway. I don't know how to answer that one. Other people report they kind of opportunistic where they might be able to get to. Yeah, I just want to thought about, you know, it's interesting, it's pretty extreme longevity. You know? And you look at how they fit in, you know, sort of the relationship between growth and longevity and, you know, some of these relationships that are varying over lots of different paths and see if these animals in these extreme, extreme places are, you know, outliers to that kind of life history and variant literature. That's a good point. Uh, no, I've not really looked at that. Uh, it just... I guess I come with the idea that these if things in the tropical system would happen faster, so lifespan would be growth rate be faster and, and, and lifespan shorter. That was complete opposite to me in that. Um, I, yeah, you, know, you do see the trade. You know, usually, individuals are very metabolically active, may live a long time. They're probably taking that strategy more than that. I have to guess. I've not made any comparisons to other studies. That's something interesting to look into, though. That's pretty deep survival. Yeah, they're, they're, they're doing like probably the opposite of hibernation. It's hot temperatures just shut down, just wait it out. But they can do it though. That's, that's the amazing part. They don't seem to do it with stress proteins. So what are they doing with it? On the, on the sex protein, you, you give me the opportunity to jump up on They are sex protein, so they respond basically to change right. rather than temperature. Absolutely. Right, right, right. right. So, what was not clear to me was the source of the cells used in that experiment. Where they came from exactly, and uh, how they compare to the different treatment you submitted to them. Yeah, um, yeah, I mean, the stress for the HSP, uh, that's a, uh, a lot of people go that route, and so we're going to try that as well. It's, we probably should have looked for uh, entire protein reduction, all the sweet different proteins. That would be the next sort of study to go back for. Back for. Uh, those snails were collected about a, meter, uh, a kilometer away from another site just off, not in the Virgin Island, not in the National Park boundary, just outside on a, on a rocky wall as well. In, a, in, a, in one location on a, on a rock face, found a bunch of snails and brought them back to the laboratory to do all these. On, on rock face, is it sunny? Is it white? Is it because it depends on the treatment? Right, they were, all, they were pretty much collected all the sunny rock faces in that location. And they were transferred back and kept in, into, into a, a tub of water overnight. Uh, so just to confirm, you had in your HSP experiment, you had the highest expression in your hypomation. Of those, yes, at least six. So could it be possible that any of the, the subsequent time points were just remnant? HSPs from acclimation. Probably so. Yeah, yeah. That, 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 probably, that probably is so. It's looking at the decay of HSPs in some ways. It wasn't designed that way. So that's 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 it's all I think it's intriguing just if you but it, it wasn't that, it was just look at HSPs alone. You might miss, miss some of these features on here. It's probably not just HSPs which are going on here. It's probably all induction and just shutting things down. That's what's probably going on here. Uh, but I think it's a little caveat to say you just look at that sort of stuff, not looking at the controls, otherwise you're going to be missing some of the figures. There's probably something else going on. I don't know what that is. What about the mucus? The what? The mucus secretion. The mucus? Mucus. Mucus. What are uh, you are interested in looking whether there are change, the chemical change, and the quality and quantity basically? Um, that's another line of work to go. That's, I, that's, I hope I get some ideas from you guys here today. <laughs> <laughs> to go on. Um, yeah, the mucus is going to be terribly expensive to produce in here anyway. Um, and you know, if, if, when they get in dry surfaces, they usually stop pretty quickly. No, and that's, that's how I get to not move by drying them out a lot and keep them warm. So. So um, the rock temperatures, the body temperatures you get of animals is actually very similar to what I get in Friday Harbor, right? right? Yep. Where you have hot rocks, low tides for a long time, low tide at the middle of the day, even though it's way colder in the San Juan's and the tropics. Those are the same body temperatures, same rocks that I get. The water days. Yeah. The, 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 the winkles there, um, they attach 
not rather than around the whole edge of the snail on they hang by a mucus thread. Right. And but these guys are big and heavy. So do they do any? any have, they, have I ever seen them being perched up like that? Yes. Very rarely do these smaller right. individuals. Right. And so these guys really are gluing themselves in place. Yeah. Yeah. They're not they're not pick, picking stuff up. You've seen them up right. You've seen them up off taking people with the fluid. I've seen only a couple like that. Um, all my hops mostly just laying flat in the rock. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, that would be a way to keep them a bit cooler. Right. Do you think there's a reason, or are you finding them mostly in the crevices you found them moving there, especially when you found that the crevice temperatures were just as hot as the black rock? Well, at least in that location it was too. That, that crevice had a next to a black rock as well, so I'm not sure it disentangled. It's always that way at every particular site. Um, it's hard to, you know, the crevice, I'm not, sh I'm not sure if they have a behavior seeking crevice or when they get in the crevice they don't move out as quickly. So you have to really do a time series of how much they're moving. Once you get caught in a crevice, you just, you just because you're in there, it's hard to get back out. Um, about the, so when I take a snapshot of looking at these individuals, it doesn't reflect the time it may spend trying to get into a crevice or out of a crevice. So they do seem to be aggregated around crevices. Is because they want that or is it because they, they get, it's a, it's a domain of attraction, I don't know. All right, let's uh, thank Mike and continue the discussion in the Akuba room.